Welcome back to episode three of Faraday Tech Cafe. I am your host, Gwendolyn Faraday, and in this podcast, we bring you interesting stories, information about new technologies, and fresh perspectives from around the development community. In this episode, I interview Gabriel Rodriguez, who is a blockchain developer and DevOps engineer currently working at Hedera Hashgraph. He is also the co-organizer of the Indianapolis Blockchain Developers Group and active in trying to promote the use of blockchain technologies in the community. In this interview, Gabriel is going to explain to us all about blockchain as well as the future and potential for the technology. Before we begin, I just want to convey a brief note about the topics we discuss in this episode. In today's episode, we cover various blockchain topics and ideas. While we do try to introduce these concepts in an easy to digest way, understanding that many of you may have never used blockchain technologies before, I still recommend that you check out the resources in the show notes for this episode if you want more information about what blockchain is and what it is capable of doing. Welcome to the show, Gabriel. I'm very happy to have you on here as a guest. Now, before we get to all of the fun and exciting blockchain content we have planned, would you like to introduce yourself to the audience so they can get to know you? Sure. Yeah. Hi, my name is Gabriel Rodriguez. I am a DevOps engineer and I work for Hedera Hashgraph. Uh, Previously, I used to work for Northwestern Mutual as a systems engineer. And before that was Sally Mae Bank as a senior systems administrator. Also, after high school, I joined the U.S. Marines where I did about six years of service and three tours of duty, and I got out as a sergeant uh, you know, with an honorable discharge. Today, I'm the co-organizer of the Indianapolis Blockchain Developers Meetup here in Indianapolis where we try to talk a little bit about blockchain and blockchain development and you know, foster and build a community of leaders and blockchain enthusiasts. Awesome. Yeah, definitely from knowing you personally, I've gotten to see how much work and effort you put into the blockchain community in Indianapolis. And we definitely appreciate all of your effort here. Real quick, do you want to tell us the story of how you got into tech in the first place? I had a natural affinity as a young kid. I think video games was the gateway for me. Mm -hmm. Uh, Electronic gaming, um, you know, whether it was a Game Boy, whether it was video game consoles and then I think what really took off was during high school I went to a vocational technical school so like my junior senior year half my day was learning uh, about computers and electronics and computer networking and it's where I built my first PC and I mounted my first Xbox and learned a whole whole lot about computer networking so that was a those were really formative years for me. So you first got into technology because of gaming So what then drew you to work in DevOps? And also, do you want to explain what is DevOps in case someone here doesn't know? Sure. So before I go into what what is DevOps, I'll explain my career path. So while I was in the Marine Corps, I went to a career path of a data network specialist. So basically what that basically means is uh, it's a traditional systems administrator, except at the military level. So every unit would have their own sysadmins. You'd have your typical break, fix, help desk guys um, that would repair the colonel's computer or repair the computer and supply or wherever. You know, on top of that, also traditional exchange administration. So setting up email accounts, setting up accounts on the network. Those simple tasks that everyone does in their organizations today. So, you know, as an IT administrator, I did that for the Marines. And I, you know, did that for a while. You know, after getting out of the Marine Corps, I still continued that path in different organizations. Well, where I got into DevOps was my past couple gigs. I started at Sally May and then continued at Northwestern, and, and now you know I had Dara with my title. Um, but what it means is that it means to me automate everything and automate my job to a point where, you know, ten years ago when I was building a server or making accounts, you know, I used to have the luxury of having days to do that. Now I need to you know do the same amount of I had the same amount of time, but I have the, the scale is much much bigger. So what I mean by that, I would, instead of doing one server, I'd be deploying 10 or 100 or 1,000 servers. And it gets to the point where I'm now automating everything that I used to do as an IT administrator with scripting, with coding. Um, So that's 
in a nutshell, what a DevOps engineer is. It's basically the IT operations, not the programming, but it's, you know, configuring firewall rules, configuring your switches, all the identity and access management, all the server setup, all the infrastructure setup that has to get done and turning that into code. What used to be uh, administration with graphical, you know, user interface with a GUI, you know, instead of a keyboard and mouse and I click through a, a Microsoft management console. Now it's all mostly Linux based now, but doing it all with uh, some sort of script or, you know, automation. Okay. So it sounds like you started working in kind of a sysadmin role and then migrated to DevOps, which I believe is an, a newly coined term, maybe in the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. And now it sounds like you're becoming more and more of a programmer. Is that right? Yeah, um, that's that's the thing is that I felt, you know, at an early age when I was into video games, you know, one of my career goals was, you know, in high school, like I want to be a video game programmer. I love games so much that I want to write my own video games. And then I learned that computer programming is hard. You know, when you look at textbooks, you know, back then, you know, it's like how to learn Java or C++. And then you realize that programming physics in a video game, in a 3D video game, is super hard and super math involved and very math intensive. And I just wasn't that good at math, and I just didn't have the affinity towards that. So I chose the next best thing, which was IT administration. You know, if you look at most computer science dropouts, where they naturally go is into information systems management, you know, or IT or information technology management, whatever whatever flavor you want to call it, informatics. I was able to hide as an IT sysadmin from programming for a good portion of my career until no longer. I feel that the traditional systems administrator is like a dinosaur in terms of we're going extinct and we're being replaced by software developers who will love to eat our lunch so much so that they have realized, hey, I can automate the IT administrator's you know, job. It takes them too long to get me what I want. I want a server. I want an environment. I want all this set up because I want to start writing code. And when it comes down to the value proposition for a company, you know, IT is just a support cost versus the development side is where they're spending the R&D money. So whatever gets, you know, a developer writing code and into production the fastest is what's going to happen. So I realize that, you know, I just have to conform to that and support those developers writing code into production. And that means me writing code. I have to be able to build infrastructure as fast as they want it or, you know, be able to have that same level of agility, that same sort of speed and velocity. That kind of explains why I got into DevOps. Yeah, that makes sense. So I want to kind of switch gears here and start to talk about blockchain. So I want to start off by asking you, what is a blockchain? Just so we're all on the same page. And why would someone or some company want to use it? You bring up a good question. What is a blockchain? And I think I should take the time to harp on this term. Specifically, when we think about a blockchain, we're thinking about a distributed and hopefully a decentralized digital ledger. So much so that we want to have the ability to record transactions to like a database, or sometimes we call that a registry, you know. And when you think about what do we record to a registry, we record births, we record deaths, we record land, uh, so land titles, registries. So that's, in a sense, what a blockchain is. It's just a digital ledger that contains the information of important events. If it's just a digital ledger, how is it beneficial for people or companies to use versus you know, any other ledger technology or system? Right. So there's a couple key points to why a blockchain is prominent now. The first and foremost is a decentralized distributed uh, public ledger it allows us to disintermediate information so what what i mean is we can remove the middleman and we can establish trust where we didn't have that before so when we think about for example banks that have ledgers that can to, you know have the, the balance of our accounts we're trusting a bank to have accurate bookkeeping well now with blockchain technology we can record very similar transactions, very similar balances or what what have you, whatever sort of asset that you feel is valuable. You can record that and you don't have to have a centralized system that provides that trust. You can now have a copy that is agreed upon by multiple parties and distributed in, in a quick way that provides that sort of trust. So to answer the question, what are the applications or use cases? Well, we all know the, the killer app. It's called Bitcoin. That's the most most yeah. commonly used one. 
But we're starting to see other companies use information, uh, you know, this, this sort of trust in a different way. Uh, one I like to highlight is, for example, information polling and gathering. So, for example, when we think about the censorship of information today, you know, fake news, as you may want to call it or term it, it's somewhere we have to agree upon and store that sort of information. So if you think about Wikipedia, you know, it's so easy to manipulate, so easy to control. But let's say at some point everyone agrees on a specific definition of Wikipedia. Let's say that article, whatever you're reading on a specific topic, maybe it's a fly or a butterfly. Once we've agreed upon that, well, we don't want that to go away. Right now, Wikipedia is supported by, you know, a nonprofit foundation. But what if we had a system that would forever store that data entry or, for example, update it in the future, but at least have the original copy that was there so we can go back in the past and audit it. So some kind of that version history. That's what allows us to have that technology and that, uh, that's, that trust in place. Okay, interesting. So you're saying kind of the decentralized trust is the cornerstone of blockchain. Yes, I think that's, that's, that's the most important thing. You know, as my company, we have the phrase, uh, the trust layer of the internet. That is what blockchain or decentralized, you know, distributed ledger technology provides. Awesome. So thanks for that intro to blockchain. So stepping back a little bit, when did you get started in blockchain? Sure. I got started in blockchain right around 2011. So a couple years after Bitcoin came out, it was, you know, still out there, but it wasn't like what it is worth the value it is today. And I wanted to do Bitcoin mining because, you know, I heard, I heard here's the thing that's going to be the next big thing. However, at the time when I wanted to get into Bitcoin mining, I learned that it was no longer profitable to use CPUs and GPUs. Well, maybe it may be close to maybe it was GPUs, but it, it came to the point where ASICs got involved. Now you had dedicated uh, mining hardware. And I didn't want to go ahead and buy dedicated mining hardware for a speculative venture like Bitcoin. In hindsight, that would have been great if I did that, but I just didn't know. I didn't have the stomach to, you know, to do that. So I moved to the next, next best thing, which was Litecoin mining, which did go to the GPU route. But then, of course... ASICs got involved and I got my first ASIC miner, which was, you know, a hundred dollar little miner, but that wasn't profitable enough. And then I discovered Ethereum, which was ASIC resistant, which means I could use GPUs. So I could buy graphics cards. I can use them in my computer for computer games, but I can also use them for mining Ethereum. And that was a bit profitable until, you know, where we're at today, it's the amount of GPUs and the amount of electricity you need to continue mining. I mean, it's so much so that I just don't have the stomach to continue anymore. You know, maybe it is profitable some days if the price is right, but I just completely exited it and decided to move to the technology behind it instead of just uh, the speculative uh, tokenomics of, of mining. Okay, so you got into mining first, which is kind of, you know, speculation, but then you said you got interested in the technology behind blockchain. So is that when you helped start the blockchain group? Well, well, to be fair... It was you who started the group, and I just happened to, <laughs> to, to join that day. When, yeah, so I was looking into blockchain groups. Now that I moved to a bigger city, I knew there was going to be other like-minded individuals who were interested into those blockchain technology, and there happened to be. I, I, we weren't the only ones, but we were the ones that kind of started the group. And, you know, there's, I think there's another group out there maybe that also started similar at the same time, but we, we managed here in our community to foster that. And I would say, though, that since the past two years, it's been quite a journey. We've done a project together. We've done many talks. I can't think of how many. We've done many presentations. And, and at least for me, it's helped me lead into a certification and into a job. Yeah. I just want to say that you definitely helped get the group off the ground. It's difficult to run and organize any group and to do all of the different things. So it was really helpful having you there with me to grow this community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do so. I, I didn't initially join a meetup. I've never had experience running a meetup. I didn't join to, to say I'm going to be the organizer. No, it just happened to be that you were the only one doing anything, and I realized that if there was nobody to help, you know, there was nobody else to pick up slack. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that I had, we had to be the, the vision that we wanted it to be. You know, if I wanted to be a big group and I wanted to see stuff happen. I had to be willing to roll up the sleeve. So that's, that's why I got involved. Definitely feel like we've learned a lot about blockchain technologies, running the group and having to give presentations and stuff. 
So of everything that you have learned so far of all the blockchain technologies, what do you think is going to be the most important, I guess, growth potential for blockchain, let's say in the next five to 10 years? Let me, let me see if I can rephrase this question or if I can reinterpret it. Where does blockchain technology go from here in the next five years? Now, I'm not saying I have the answer, but I think I see some light at the end of the tunnel. So when we think about in blockchain technology, we have this blockchain trilemma, as Vitalik Buterin, the founder of Ethereum, he's the one who kind of coined this. And we have this speed, uh, scalability, and security problem. So as we see in Bitcoin, we don't have the speed, but we have the scalability and the security. Meaning so, for example, if we make a transaction with Bitcoin, it takes 10 minutes for that transaction you know, to make it to the network. And then you're going to want to wait at least till six other nodes validate that. So that means you're waiting for an you know, up to an hour to trust your um, transaction is ordered. So when I say, you know, if I, if I was to put that to a real world scenario, Bitcoin does not make sense to buy a cup of coffee at your local coffee shop because nobody wants to wait an hour from when you get there to, you know, placing orders. Say, ah, yes, I trust your Bitcoin and make the transaction. So that's not a very good uh, use case right now. Then we look at some of the other, you know, blockchains trying to to solve this issue. Well, we look at Litecoin and they reduced it from, you know, 10 minutes to, you know, a much shorter piece of time. But then you also have the scalability issue where you have to, you know, spend all this computing power, uh, all this electricity, really, all these resources to, to scale it and to make it secure. So we have this issue where how can we make things scalable and secure and, and, and all those things. So we look at different consensus mechanisms. Um, and so far, the consensus mechanisms still require a trade-off. So we, now we have private ledgers where the consensus mechanism says, let's cede some authority to somebody. Let's, let's, let's agree that we can't trust everybody in, the, as a, in a public ledger where just anybody can join at will and leave at will. So now we have these you know, private networks where someone says, okay, we're going to validate everybody participating, and then we're going to elect somebody to order transactions for us. And to me, that kind of defeats the purpose of a decentralized ledger because you still because now you have to see the authority and now you have to trust somebody this centralized figure and that i mean it gets us there but it's not perfect and many many uh organizations are okay with that many have already have we already have that private model but for me i think the next iteration is where you can have the speed the scalability and the security in a blockchain, uh, in a blockchain network. So that's that's where we're at today, and that's specifically the company that I'm at. I think they've got that solved uh, with the with the Hedera Hashgraph. So you mentioned consensus mechanisms. So that's basically where all the participants in a network come to an agreement about what transactions to include in these blocks that make up the blockchain or the order of transactions. But you also mentioned when you cede authority to someone on the blockchain, you're having to trust them, which is a problem. Don't you inherently have to trust people through consensus mechanisms on the blockchain anyways? Right. So there's different ways to approach consensus. And it comes all down to the protocol you, you agree to use. Some people use something, for example, proof of elapsed time. You can just say, hey, the first one to get your transaction in wins. That's a good one. Um, in Bitcoin, their use case is pretty interest, interesting. They use what's called proof of work. And they just basically say, whoever solves this puzzle first is the one who gets to order the transactions. So that becomes you know, a race to solve this puzzle. So if you think about, if I was to put it into a layman's terms, or if I was to imagine how would this work, if we were all trying to solve this puzzle, if I made the scenario, if I have 10 people in a room, and I'm going to award the winner of these 10 people to the first person to solve a, a Sudoku puzzle. And you know, in Sudoku, you can, you know, you basically put the numbers together and you, you know, you don't, you don't want to have the same number in the same rows. And you can have the level difficulty. So I can adjust the difficulty by removing numbers or, you know, or I can, or by putting them in. So I can make it game easier by putting more numbers in and people can solve it faster. So, you know, I can kind of grade the curve of, you know, how the network is performing. So let's say I have a bunch of 10 strangers and I can get an average of how fast they're solving it, uh, this, this, like the Sudoku puzzle. And if, let's say, all of a sudden I get some MIT grads or some super smart people, well, then I can take out numbers and make it more difficult. That's how Bitcoin works in terms of 
proof of lapse time. The first person to solve it gets it. And then sometimes people say, you know what, let's, let's team together. Let's, and that's what happens in Bitcoin. People are pooled together the resources and says, all right, since I'm not going to be able to do it on my own, but if we work together, we'll all be able to share the, you know, the award. And that's what happens in Bitcoin. And we worry about those pools becoming so aggregate, so, uh, so large that they become the majority of the, of the four. So there's, there's things that we have to worry about, you know, like, this, for example, I'll start to reference into the 51% attack where you have more than 51% of the people working on the, yeah, the consensus mechanism, they could go ahead and control what gets uh, ordered in, in the transactions and in, in the system. Those are some of the things that we, we have to wor- uh, look out and worry about. So you're saying that if the network has a majority of bad actors, that's a vulnerability or a security vulnerability because then they control all of the transactions, basically. Exactly. So that's that's the, the heart of a good blockchain is how you can decentralize to where you have enough people that no one person can control the entire entire system versus you know the opposite model where we have one system that you have to trust and hopefully they don't turn out to be like Wells Fargo yeah well they open up accounts and in your name and you didn't know about it a minute ago you mentioned DAGs or directed acyclic graphs I know you recently gave a talk on this topic as well at our blockchain meetup and you said it was a post blockchain technology so do you envision these technologies replacing blockchain or is there room for both of them to kind of grow side by side? There's absolutely room for both. So when we think about where different directed acyclic graphs are, I like to point to our company's use cases on the Hedera consensus service. So for example, we are offering our consensus mechanism available to other blockchain technologies. So for example, we now have a project with Hyperledger where instead of using Hyperledger's uh, redundant Byzantine fault tolerance, you, you can use Hedera's consensus service instead. So we have the claim that we have a faster consensus uh, mechanism service, and faster than the redundant Byzantine fault tolerance. So that's something where you can say, of, hey, maybe we can swap out the best consensus mechanism and go from there. We don't have to completely re-architect. Uh, and also, for example, we, we're taking the solidity and we're bringing it over into Hedera. So it's not that we don't have to completely scrap old systems. If you've written stuff in Solidity for, you know, for Ethereum, you should be able to take that same, you know, chain code and bring it over to Hedera and run it at a uh, much faster and a much cheaper cost than what you're currently on Ethereum. And I mean, again, we're still building it out. We're still, you know, the jury's still out of, is this the best mechanism or not? But what's going to happen is that you're going to have a lot of innovation done by different blockchains. And whichever one happens to be the most proven model is what's going to dictate in the market uh, today. So I definitely think there's space for everybody. You know, there there are other uh, directed acyclic graphs out there. Um, For example, if you take Nano, they have an interesting model where they don't have a token. You know, they don't, they do not reward miners for processing the transactions. The, The goal is, is that people would just run a node altruistically because the the sum of the network happens to be worth it enough for you that you know you're providing this service to the world. I don't know personally if that's a good model because you know you still have to run you, you know if you look at the, re, the system requirements for nano you still got to have a lot of bandwidth to have all these transactions that you got to process through your, you know your own thing. So you got to spend the money on the bandwidth, you got to spend the money on the electricity, even if it's not such a powerful computer you you need in CPU memory. You know, those are still resources that you have to provide. And that's why I take the reference of BitTorrent. I always reference this in, in my talks, how BitTorrent never proved to be as successful as it could have been. And the reason is, is because there was no incentive mechanism for people to continue to seed files. Once I downloaded something in BitTorrent, I had no incentive for me to, to reshare it. Now, there was kind of these systems where there was like these uh, pools or where you would go, you would join this network where you they would monitor your upload rate so if you maintain a specific upload rate you can reach that download rate which is you know may or may not work but long term it, okay. it just wasn't the the killer app and if you look at today how many times you actually use a BitTorrent download versus a direct download most people choose a direct download because i don't have to worry about having the client anymore but if you think at back to 2004 where we were at you know it was, I believe, what, 60% of all traffic in Asia in 2004, um, and at least 25% of all internet traffic. So it definitely had its use case, but you need a, a decent incentive mechanism to host the infrastructure. Yeah, we'll, we'll see how it goes, and uh, and I think DAGs are going to be 
they're going to solve that blockchain trilemma that I, I referenced earlier. So I want to get back to talking about your own experience. I know you got a blockchain certification last year. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Somewhere along the line in, in the past year or two years ago, I made it a goal for myself that I wanted to become a blockchain developer or I wanted to work at the blockchain industry by 2020. That was a personal goal of mine. But that is a very difficult goal. The reason I say that is working in this industry, it's still new. There's not, a, there's not that many opportunities. So for example, if you're a traditional software developer, if you're specifically like a front-end developer and you work in JavaScript or HTML or CSS, or whatever front-end technologies you use, front-end jobs are dime a dozen. Same thing with back-end, whether you're a specific database admin or, or so on and so forth. Most people have that. Even in, in DevOps, there's plenty of those jobs out there. But working in blockchain, it's not quite the case. It's much more difficult. And I realized that if I wanted to work in blockchain, I need to have some sort of credential, some sort of proof that I knew what I was talking about. And so I decided to pursue the blockchain uh, solution architect certification provided by the Blockchain Training Alliance. And so one of the things I had to do is I had to find out who even offers a legitimate course that I would brag about, essentially, you know, who, who has. And there's a few of them out there, but I found that BTA had a pretty good course in terms of, you know, when I looked at the study guide, I'm like, yep, this is, this is kind of like the material that makes sense that, you know, and I still had to study for it. I, you know, I had to still read the book, but it made sense to what I was already learned or, or, you know, before, you know, before I even read the material, I was kind of already prepared for it. And it made sense to, this is what blockchain technology is, and this is the history of it. And so on and so forth. Also, they had the, the the testing mechanism wasn't something that you just did online. It's not something you could have cheat on. You know, almost it's almost impossible to. You had to go into a certified testing center, the same places where you would go get another certification like your A plus or your Net plus or those certified tests. I think called, I think they're Pearson View testing centers. So you know you have to provide two forms of ID. They have a camera on you. They monitor you. So there's no really way to cheat. So I wanted something that says, yes, this is, you know, something that there is a bar to pass. And it's not just anybody can take it. And once I did that, you know, that's something I can hold on to say, ha, I, I did this. And, you know, when you look at how many people in the city have taken it, I can only count on, I think, three to four individuals. So that already put me ahead of my peers. Anybody else who says, I do blockchain. Because you look on LinkedIn or you looked online and you can see all these cryptocurrency experts or whatever, gurus, whatever they call them. But I wanted to have a specific focus as this is what I do and this is what I know. So that's why I decided to go for that certification. And I encourage anybody else to follow that path or, or, or to get something today. Maybe there might be different certifications in, that you, you should go for. Power to you. But just find something that uh, and, and go from there. So now that you work in the blockchain space, you recently got hired at Hashgraph. Do you think that a certification helped you get there? Helped you get the job? I think it played a factor, uh, for sure. Specifically, that I was interviewing for a DevOps position, so what I already knew from my existing job was relevant. But you know, when you think about the time it takes to bring someone into the industry, most blockchain companies that are, that are legitimate, they don't want to have to try to explain to a developer or an engineer what a blockchain is and why is it relevant. If they don't know why it's relevant, then they're at the wrong place. You know, you have to have some sort of understanding and passion for it and i think that certification helped explain that look this is how much it means to me not only am i doing in or you know going to meetups or running a meetup i'm willing to spend my own money and go through a certification program because i think it's that important so if anything it at least spoke to the, my character because they didn't have to quiz me on what i knew on blockchain because their distributed ledger technology is different fundamentally from what I already knew about Bitcoin and Ethereum. It's just another one. But having that fundamental background did help and, and explaining what kind of candidate I was. Interesting. So it didn't just help like showing them that you had the knowledge. It was more about the dedication and passion that you had for blockchain and showing them that you're really committed to a career in blockchain, basically. Yeah, I think that was my selling point for, you know, why me versus another DevOps engineer. So looking back at how you got into blockchain and your journey, would you recommend developers, software developers, start learning blockchain? And how would you recommend they do that? So that's a very broad question. So should a software developer learn blockchain? 
it depends if it's relevant to what they're trying to do. If you're a front end person that never touches blockchain technology, maybe not. But I think in general, it's something you have to know from the very basics. You have to understand how it's going to fundamentally alter technology going forward. And front end people are not going to care much about back end technologies. And specifically, blockchain is a back end technology. So I guess I can rephrase that. Do you think it's going to be important? for software developers to know going forward. Yes, it is. It is going to be important. Just like any new disruptive technology, you have to at least understand how it's going to affect you. One day, organizations are going to be at that pivot point where they're going to ask, do you have blockchain technology skills in your, you know, in your curriculum vitae? Do you have that or not? And that may be a differentiator. I'm not saying right now that's going to be a thing, but I will tell you this, if you do have it, you're going to command a much better price. And maybe for that reason alone, just for your own career worth, it's worth investing into. So if someone wants to get started now, what pathway or tools or resources would you recommend for them? The first thing I recommend is understanding how blockchain fundamentally works, uh, the, specifically the cryptography behind it. One invaluable resource I tell anybody is starting at Anders.com slash blockchain. That was a key fundamental tutorial on how a blockchain works in terms of having to create a chain of transactions using cryptography and using you know public key encryption. That is a fundamental start to at least get the understanding of it. Um, that's where I recommend anybody starting on what a blockchain is. And then I also recommend using a blockchain whether it's making a transaction in Bitcoin or, or, or um, going to, you know, those uh, ATMs that have, uh, like, you, you can exchange crypt cryptocurrencies, you know, for example, say, hey, I'm, I'm going to change a dollar for however value of Bitcoin or Ethereum, whatever cryptocurrency you want. I recommend starting there and having some currency and understanding how that works. And then if you're a software developer, I recommend then going into playing with the SDKs, go into those tutorials, go to Ethereum, go use MetaMask, go use Ethereum Remix, and start writing chain code, start writing uh, the software that's going to power the future. Awesome. Those sound like great recommendations. So we've covered a lot so far. Do you have any final words or anything else you want to talk about here? I think I just want to first give props to everyone who's participated in our meetup. Yourself included, of course, Gwen. Everybody who's made this a thing, uh, we're over 250 members. You don't have to be a software developer. You just have the interest in, in learning how because there's so much opportunity for this. There's for, for business analysts, for, for leaders, for technology executives. I think there's a great space for this. And I want to thank all those people who came to our meetups and who will come to our meetups and are interested. So, so thank you. So I know this is kind of a special time for everyone being in lockdown, most of us are stuck at home. So do you have any recommendations for ways to pass the time? It doesn't have to be blockchain related, maybe a book or a movie or TV show that you would recommend. I got one that I recently remembered. For some of those who may not have board games, if you have a stopwatch, I recommend playing stopwatch baseball. If you haven't played it, it's real simple. The goal is, is to start a stopwatch and stop it exactly at one second and with no trailing milliseconds. That's a home run, okay? If you stop it at 0.97, that's a single. If you score, you, for example, you draw a little diamond on a piece of paper and you put like a penny or some sort of marker, you start it at home plate. And if you stop it at 97, that, that runner gets, a, uh, you know, to first base. If you stop it at 98, they'll get to second base. And if you stop it at 99, that's a triple, they'll get to third base. And you can play entire innings of just stopwatch baseball. <laughs> and, you know, if you miss, you know, if you don't get, if you, let's say you get 0.95 or you get 103 or 112, whatever, that's a strike. You get three strikes again and out. You know, you get three outs, you, you know, go to another inning. So you can play with one person, you can play with a whole nine. I mean, a whole, a whole roster of nines. If you're looking for something to do to pass the time, uh, stopwatch baseball is a, a good one to bring back. Real quick, is that played solo or do you play with other people? You can play solo, but it's more fun with another person because then you have two different people with a stopwatch. So, for example, different innings. So, for example, we were to play, uh, let's say I go on the top of the first, and if I get as, try to get as many runs as possible, and then I, once I'm all out, then I hand you the stopwatch, and then you try to get as many runs for that inning, just like in a real baseball game. That sounds interesting. 
Yeah, look it up. Google it. Uh, Stop Watch Baseball. It's, uh, it's definitely a way to pass the time. So where can people find you online? If you're looking to connect with me professionally, uh, LinkedIn, linkedin.com slash IN slash Indy dash Gabriel dash Rodriguez. Um, also on Twitter at Injected Fusion. So that's a, another good place to check me out uh, if you're on Twitter. And I'm also on GitHub as well, you know, uh, GitHub uh, at Injected Fusion, same handle. All right, Gabriel, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Faraday Tech Cafe. Don't forget that all of the info and items that were mentioned during the podcast are listed in the show notes for this episode. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a positive review on your podcasting platform of choice. For questions or feedback related to the show, you can email us at contact at FaradayAcademy.com. And don't forget to check out our YouTube channel for more great content on a variety of programming topics. Subscribe to the podcast so you can get notified about new episodes that come out every Monday. Until next time.